We're continuing our series in Acts called The Movement Opposed. And we're looking at the sermon that got Stephen killed. Now, it's a little bit of a long sermon. The chapter is about 60 verses, so we're not going to be able to cover all of it. But I don't think it's actually the long sermon that got Stephen killed. And I certainly hope not, because I've done that occasionally. So what we're going to see this morning, though, is that the crowd actually stoned Stephen over a disagreement about their story and over a disagreement about whose story it really was and whether they had any legitimate claim to say, this is our story. So as we've seen throughout the book of Acts and as we've highlighted throughout the book of Acts, when we dive into Acts, we're really looking at our story. We're looking at the ongoing story of this unstoppable movement called the church that was unleashed by Jesus when it was just one guy named Jesus wandering around the Judean countryside we saw this unstoppable movement of God begin. And it expanded from one man to 12 disciples, to 120 people, to 3,000, to 5,000, to many, many, many thousand, and ultimately to the ends of the earth. And we know that this movement made it to the ends of the earth because we're here. 2,000 years later, two continents away, across the Atlantic Ocean, we are here today because these guys were a part of a movement that was getting the job done and that was taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And now our part in the story is to continue that movement and to take the gospel message back to the ends of the earth, to the opposite ends of the earth, wherever that might be. So we have highlighted throughout the series that this is our story. And that's exciting. The mission of God is an exciting thing. It's an exciting story to be a part of. But if we're being honest, it's also a very hard thing to be a part of. The mission is difficult. So one of the ways that we stay encouraged and that we, that we motivate ourselves to remain faithful to the message and to the mission that we've been given is to look back at our story and remember how God has moved in the past and how God has committed himself to continue to move. And to realize that all of these amazing, miraculous things that God did in the past, we are connected to that. It's not just their story, it's our story. They are writing the early chapters in the book and we are continuing to write the story of God, the story of his church. Their story is our story. So we've been talking about that throughout the series, but this morning I want to push back on that assurance a little bit and just ask the question more on an individual level, is this really your story? And on a corporate level, is the story of the church really our story? Is the story of this amazing, rapid expansion to the ends of the earth our story or is it somebody else's story? Because all of us want to be a part of a winning team. All of us, we see something that's going well, and we're like, I want to be associated with that. That team is winning, I want to be associated with them. Okay? So we have this tendency, trying to puff ourselves up, trying to make ourselves feel good about ourselves, that we see a winning story and we say, I want to be a part of that. I want to claim that story as my story. So we see it in sports. What happens when your team wins? What do you say? Say, we won. Right? I don't, I don't know what it has to do with we, with we, but we won. So this is a special day. Cubs have been having kind of a rough season, but I'm really excited to see a lot of Cardinals fans in the house. Love you guys. Just to say, hey, we're two games into this three-game series, and so far the Cubs are winning. We are winning. Okay? So we're excited about that. Now, some of you, maybe who you're, if you're a sports fan, you're used to this language. This is our team. We won. If you're not a sports fan, then, then you might push back against that and say, now, in what sense did we win? You know, are, are you saying, did I pitch in the seventh inning? Did you hit a home run? Is that how we won? Because from where I'm sitting, it doesn't look like we won. It looks like those guys over there in Chicago beat those other guys over there that were traveling from St. Louis. All right? In what sense did we win? You know, if you're... And I'm saying all this stuff, and if you are a sports fan, maybe you're disconnecting. You're like saying, well, we won. I mean, what, what's the problem here? But if you married somebody who is not a sports fan, then, then they really connect with this. And they look at you, and they see how you claim somebody else's story as your story, and how you get so much of your identity wrapped up in their story. And they're like, you know, there, there's something really, really goofy going on here. But we do it. And we even find ways to justify it. You know, if somebody, if somebody asks us, in, in what sense did we win? How are you a part of that? I'm like, well. Well, I mean, it, it was late in the game and we were trailing. I put on my rally cap and, and I crossed my fingers. And, and when the time came 
When the time came when that solo shot, it, it was looking like it was going to drift foul. Well, I went, no, no, over here. And I kept that ball fair. And we won. All right? Okay, Cardinal Sands, I'll give you a break. But man, I'm looking forward to this afternoon. I hope we complete the sweep. It's going to be great. Love you, buddy. Yeah? Good. But this is something that, that we do in culture. It's something we don't just do with sports, but it happens so commonly with sports that they even make movies about this whole phenomenon. So, for me, a, a baseball movie, it doesn't have to be a good movie to be a movie that I like because it's simply a baseball movie. So an example of that is Fever Pitch, and it is this movie about this rabid Red Sox fan. I know some of you guys really love baseball. You're thrilled. We won't talk about baseball next week, I promise. Unless the Cubs sweep, we might. We'll see. So Ben, he's this rabid Red Sox fan. And he's, he's interested in this girl named Lindsay who knows nothing about baseball. There's a scene in the movie where she's got a lot of work to do, so she brings her MacBook to the game, and she's, you know, typing and doing her work during the game, and she gets struck by a foul ball because she's not paying attention to the game. And everyone's like, yeah, you had that coming. You know, divine justice going on right here. But this is a guy who decorates his entire apartment in Red Sox, and all of his clothes, they have a Red Sox logo or, or the name Red Sox across them, and he's... He's dating this girl who, who knows nothing about baseball, cares nothing about baseball. She doesn't know who Carl Yastrzemski is. Some of you guys, you don't know either. You're cool with that. But if you're a Red Sox fan, if you live in Boston, you've got to know this stuff. And this guy, he's, he's got season tickets, hasn't missed a game in 15 years. Every year, he and his buddies, they make their annual pilgrimage down to spring training to scout the Red Sox. So at one point in the movie, she's just trying to understand this. You go down there and you scout the team. Wow, that's amazing. So, so these guys, they ask you for input on their players after you scouted them? And he's like, no. So in what sense are you scouting them? Why are you scouting them? You know, and there's, there's this disconnect. Why are you building your life around some story that is not your story? But we tend to do that because we want to be associated with a winning team. Okay? We want to be associated with a winning story. And what we're going to see in the book of Acts is that Stephen gets himself stoned over a disagreement about his story and about their story and whether they have any legitimate right, these early first century Jews, to claim a part in the redemptive story of God. And these guys will say, we are a part of this story. This is our story. We celebrate this story. We are the people of God. We are the children of Abraham. We are the followers of Moses. This is our story. But Stephen's going to come in there with bad news, and he's going to let them know, I don't think this is your story. Because I look at your lives, and I don't see your lives as a continuation of this story. Oh, I think you're excited about the story, and you're claiming a connection to the story. But I think that connection is kind of surfacy. At a heart level, I don't think that you are connected to this story. I think your story is more show than go. It's more appearance than reality. And he's going after them in a way that cuts at their identity. And they are ticked. Because they define themselves around this story of God and being the people of God. And he's saying, I don't think this is your story. So this morning, I want to wrestle, I want us to wrestle with the same question that Stephen is asking his audience to wrestle with. To ask the question, is the story of the church really our story? Is the book of Acts really our story? Do we stand in a long line of men and women of faith who have placed their faith in Jesus, who have surrendered their lives to Jesus? who lovingly pursue Jesus and who sacrifice all that they are to see other people introduced to Jesus. Is that our story? Or are we just trying to jump on the bandwagon and say, hey, I kind of like this. I want to be associated with this winning story. So we're in Acts chapter 7, sermon that got Stephen stoned. The first question is, why is the crowd angry? Because we got this guy named Stephen, who we know to be full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit, who has decided to preach. He's preaching Jesus. He's preaching the gospel. He's preaching this message that you and I are really messed up. That we are broken. That we are sinful. That we are more wretched and sinful than we ever dared believe. And yet through faith in Jesus Christ, through faith in his death and resurrection, we have the opportunity to be reconciled to God and to be more loved and accepted than we ever dared hope. So he is preaching these messages to these guys. And where is he preaching it? We get the impression that Stephen is going back into the synagogue to preach. So he's a Jewish boy. Just like the Christians were gathering for worship, the Jews were gathering for worship. The early Jews, the early Christians, they were Jews. So they had these Jewish gatherings 
where they're worshiping the God of the Old Testament and they're looking forward to a coming Messiah. Some of those guys, they realize Jesus is that coming Messiah and they began to worship Jesus. And eventually they get kicked out of the synagogue. They go gather over here. But Stephen says, no, I grew up in the synagogue. I love these people. These people are my family. So I am taking the gospel and I am going back to them and I'm going to preach the gospel in the synagogue. And he preached it with power and the Holy Spirit moved and people in the synagogue realized Jesus is our Messiah and we are going to surrender our lives to Jesus through faith in Jesus Christ. All right? Which is great for the church as we see people leaving the synagogue to come into the church. But it's really bad for the synagogue. So the synagogue leaders, they are ticked. They are really frustrated that he is coming into their house and recruiting people to go over to his house. So opposition arose. And they secretly persuaded some men to say, we've heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and they brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs Moses handed down to us. So they've got two accusations against Moses. The first one is you don't, uh, they got two accusations against Stephen, rather. The first one is you don't follow Moses. You are trying to violate his teachings that we've been following for 2,000 years. You are messing with Moses. Second accusation, you don't love God's temple. In fact, you want to destroy God's temple. And these are two charges that are more than enough to get a Jewish boy killed in first century Israel. And they're false charges, or at the very least, they're very distorted charges. You know, there's something that his opposition is trumping up to get him in trouble to try to get him killed. But they're taking these charges very seriously, and it's got the community riled. So verse 1, then they bring them all before the high priest, before the Sanhedrin, before the ruling council that has the authority to say whether he should be sentenced to death. Then the high priest asked him, are these charges true? And he replied to them, and I want you to see throughout his reply that it is very respectful and it is very relational. By the end, Stephen gets really fiery. And we're not surprised that the audience is ticked. But especially early on, he is just trying to love these guys well and get the message to them. So he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. Man, I love you guys. We are family. I've got a message that you need to hear from me as a brother, as a son, as a part of your family. I want to tell you about Jesus. So he starts this story. And it's not just his story, but he's saying, guys, this is our story. So listen to me about our story. The God of glory appeared to our father, Abraham, while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land, where you are living now. He gave him no inheritance here, not even a foot of ground, but God promised, God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said. And afterward, they will come out of that country and worship in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. And Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob the father of the patriarchs. So Stephen is beginning to highlight for these guys, we are a family. We have a common heritage and story. You guys are my brothers. Abraham isn't just your father. Abraham is our father. We are in this together. This is our story that I'm telling. So don't get mad at me. I am one of your brothers. We share a story. We value so much of the same stuff. He reminds them that they have a shared heritage that is so important that every male in that community actually received a mark in his flesh, a removal of his foreskin to say, we are a part of this covenant community. We are in. So he highlights that for him and says, this is our story. We love our story. We share our story. He goes on in verse 9. 
because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. So he says, remember guys, we have some ugly stuff in our story. There is a jealousy that runs deep in our story. There is rivalry that runs deep in our story. There is some deep hatred in our family tree that is so deep that it, that it caused our fathers to do unthinkable things to one another. So I want you to check yourselves and realize that what you are thinking about doing to me might not be the right thing. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, so they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all kinds of trouble. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So he made him ruler over Egypt and over all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering. And our fathers could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers on their first visit. Then Jacob went down to Egypt where he and our fathers died. Their bodies were bought, brought back to Shechem and placed in a tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor and Shechem for a certain sum of money. Now some of you are wondering, why all these details? Why, why capture these details in the Bible? Why go through these details in a sermon then? Why go through them in a sermon now? And it's because he's sharing their story. And every little detail that he sprinkles in there has a purpose. He mentions circumcision. He's going to come back to that later. He starts talking about promises and suffering and deliverance and the faithfulness of God, all of which he is coming back to later. And he's trying to paint this picture of, of a God who is faithful, of a God who does deliver. And he's trying to lay this out in a way that they are going to begin to see the parallels between the story of Moses and the people of Israel then and the story of Jesus. And how Jesus is the one who is to come after Moses. So Stephen, he's sharing their common story. He's, he's building a lot of rapport. He's talking about deliverance from sin and suffering and keeping promises. But ultimately, he's trying to tell them the story of the coming of Jesus. But as he tells the story of Jesus, he wants them to understand this is our story. This is our shared story. You just don't realize how it ends. It ends with Jesus. Verse 17. As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham the number of our people in Egypt greatly increased. Then another king who knew nothing about Joseph became ruler of Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. At that time, Moses was born. And now he's speaking their love language because Moses is the hero in the culture. Okay? Jackie Robinson of the day, as long as we're going with the baseball team. Driving some of you nuts. They loved Moses. So he starts talking about Moses. At this time, Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and powerful in speech and action. He says, you guys are accusing me of not following Moses, but I love Moses. I love Moses in a way that you don't even love Moses. I am trying to follow Moses here. Let's talk about Moses. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his fellow Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense, and he avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they didn't get it. And Stephen's sitting there thinking, guys, I want you to realize that God is trying to use me to rescue you. That God sent Jesus to rescue you. And you don't get it. Just like these guys didn't get it. You want to find yourself in the story? You're among the people who don't get what God is trying to do. That's what he's trying to communicate to them. But he's, at this point in the sermon, he's trying to do it as gently as he can. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you are brothers. Hello, guys, we're brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? Why are you fighting with your brothers? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you? Ruler and judge over us. We don't need a leader. We don't need a ruler. We don't need a deliverer. We don't need to follow anybody. Get out of the way, Moses. Fast forward 40 years later, Moses is at the burning bush. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals. The place where you are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. And I have heard their groaning. And I have come down to set them free. And I will send you back to Egypt. 
This is the same Moses who they rejected with their words, who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself. That's who made me ruler and judge. All right? That's who made Moses ruler and judge. That's who made Jesus ruler and judge. Their problem wasn't with Moses. Your problem isn't with Jesus. The problem is with God. God himself, who through an angel appeared to him in the burning bush, he led them out of Egypt, Moses did, and did wonders and miraculous signs in Egypt, at the Red Sea, and for 40 years in the desert. So Stephen is starting to draw out this tension among the, quote, followers of Moses, that not everybody who claimed to be a follower of Moses actually followed Moses. Okay, there's, there's all these people, all these Israelites, all these people who are the people of God, the followers of Moses, but if you look back through the Bible, you see that very few of them were really following him well. So it's one thing to claim, I'm a follower of Moses. It's another thing to actually follow him. Verse 37. This is that Moses who told the Israelites, God will send you a prophet like me from your own people. Meaning Jesus, the ultimate Moses, the fulfillment of this prophecy. He's trying to help them see the parallels between Moses and Jesus. He says, Moses was in the assembly in the desert with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, and he received living words to pass on to us. All right? Kind of like how Jesus refers to himself, the bread of life. All right? The one who is alive, the one who has living words. The very word of God. But our fathers refused to obey him, just like you're refusing to obey Jesus. Instead, they rejected him in their hearts, and they turned back to Egypt, and they told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. So they've been worshiping the living God. They get this little hiatus where Moses has gone up on the mountain for a few days. He's been gone a little bit too long. They've seen the thunder. They've seen the lightning. They've seen the miracles, all this stuff. But he goes away for a few days. They're like, man, what are we going to do? We don't even know what happened to that guy. I know what we'll do. Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. We'll give you some gold. You fashion it into a calf, and we will declare this calf to be our God, and we will follow him. An incredible, goofy thing to do. You, you, you just made something with your own hands and now you're worshiping it as God? But that's what they did. So they basically said to Aaron, Aaron, tell us a convenient lie that we will believe so that we can get on with our lives and not have to worry about obeying what God has told us to do. Tell us anything. It can be creative. It doesn't even have to be convincing. Just tell us. And we can repeat it back to ourselves until we all agree this is our God and we're going to follow in this direction. Forget about anything that God has told us to do. We are the people of God regardless. That's what these guys were asking for. And yet, they still continued to think of themselves as the people of God. That's how they saw themselves, but that is not how they lived. So God sent Moses, and he gave Moses these incredible, miraculous powers to, as proof, as evidence and proof, that he was from God. And now God, in this time, is sending Stephen with these incredible, miraculous powers to prove to them he is from God. And Stephen is pointing back to Jesus, who did even more miraculous things, and saying, hey, I'm just coming in the name of Jesus. I'm doing miracles in the name of Jesus. Jesus came to you, like Moses came to you, to prove that he is from God, and that he speaks for God. And just like your forefathers didn't follow Moses, you're not following Jesus. But the crazy thing is, even though you don't want to follow Moses, even though you don't want to follow God, I see that you still want to be associated with God. You still want to be known as the people of God. You still want to shape some of your identity around that winning team, around that culturally acceptable team. He's saying, guys, I, I think this is kind of goofy. Do you want to follow him or not? But this is the game that we play. Most of us would say, I believe in Jesus. I am a follower of Jesus. But do we actually follow Jesus? Because that's the tension that he's pointing out to them. You claim to be the people of God, the followers of Moses, but you're not following Moses because Moses is pointing to Jesus. In our day, we say, I am a Christian. I follow Jesus. But do we follow Jesus? I think most of us, if, if you're here today, you're either exploring what it would look like to follow Jesus, or you have a sincere desire to figure out, I want to follow Jesus, how do I do it? 
and yet we tend to fail to follow Jesus. Uh, some of you guys know Francis Chan. He's a preacher. He used to be out in Simi Valley, California. I have no idea where he is now. But he, he has this great illustration where he compares God, Jesus' command to us, the Great Commission, go and make disciples. He compares it to me telling my daughter to clean her room. All right? So Jesus tells us, go and make disciples. And what do we do? We memorize the verse. A lot of you guys can quote it. Great Commission, into Matthew chapter 28. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. See, I can quote it. You know, thinking about memorizing it in Greek, that'd be pretty cool. We got this thing where, where Jesus commands us to go and do something. We say, okay, I'm going to memorize it or I'm going to gather a bunch of people in my room and we're going to talk about what it would look like to maybe obey what Jesus told us to do. Now, what if it's Chloe's day to clean her room? And I tell her, Chloe, go clean your room. And she comes back two years later and says, Daddy, Daddy, I memorized what you said. Chloe, go clean your room. I can tell you in Greek. She wouldn't do that because she knows that would not go over well. She knows that she would not get her allowance that week because that is not obedience. It's clever, but it's just a distraction from obedience. All right? We want to say, I follow Jesus, but often we do not want to actually follow Jesus. Somehow we believe that as Christians, we can call ourselves followers of Jesus without actually following, without actually obeying. That we can say his story is our story, even though we're not taking any active part in the story. All right, so there's two accusations. So far we've been talking about the accusation that, that Stephen was trying to undermine the teaching of Moses. And Stephen, he's coming back at them and saying, here's the deal, I'm with Moses. I am with Moses and Jesus is with Moses. And frankly, as Moses crazy as you guys are, I don't think that you're with Moses because Moses was just there to point you to Jesus and you're not following Jesus. So whose story really is this? Moses' story is the story of Jesus. If you're not with Jesus, you're not with Moses. That's what he's starting to draw out. He's going to say it a lot more explicitly in just a minute. But that's just the first accusation. The other one, look at it really quick. He's saying, you don't love the temple. You hate the temple. You want to destroy the temple. Here's what he says about the temple, verse 44. He says, our forefathers, they had the tabernacle of the testimony with them in the desert. It was the portable tent version of the temple that they initially had. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. Having received the tabernacle, our fathers, you know, our family, our story, our fathers under Joshua brought it with them, and they took it when they took the land that from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. He says, you know what? I'm looking at my palace. It's really nice. God, your place is kind of, it's just this tent. I want to make you something nice. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by men. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all of these things? In other words, what's the big deal about the temple? The temple's really lovely. The temple's really pretty. The temple is sacred. But at the end of the day, it's just a building. And God cannot be contained in a building. All right? It's a nice building. It's lovely. It's a great place to gather and worship God. But we are not about buildings. God does not live in buildings. You go back through early in the story of Acts, he says, at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended and he said, from now on my dwelling place is going to be with men. He says, you want to know where God lives? God lives inside of me. The reason that you guys are still so excited about the building is that you're not a part of the story of God. You missed out on your story and you're still excited about this building because you think God lives in a building. But God lives in His people. And if you were continuing to move forward with a story, guys, you would know that by now. You're not over the temple yet because you're not a part of the story. You missed the Messiah. 
This isn't your story. And then he just gets fiery and he just lays it out there. You stiff-necked people, you stubborn people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. Remember, circumcision means that you've been set apart for God. He says, I look at your heart, I look at your ears, and I see no evidence of being set aside for God. You want to be associated with God, but I don't think you're a part of his story. You are just like your father's. You always resist the Holy Spirit. He says, read back through your Bible. Was there ever a prophet that your fathers didn't persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, who predicted that Jesus was coming, like Moses. He wasn't killed by them, but he predicted Jesus. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put in effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. He says you memorized it, you can quote it, with tears in your eyes you sing about it, but man, do you live it? In other words, I don't think you're a part of the story. I don't think you're a part of this team. In fact, I think you are playing for the opposite team. But when they heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. Because this is their identity. This is, this is how they saw themselves. This is all they had. And this is one of the most common reactions that you get as you try to share the gospel with people who are religious. Because this audience was supremely religious. Okay, so if you're trying to share the gospel with somebody who is culturally Christian, you know, who, who can go back a bunch of generations, yeah, I was confirmed, I was sprinkled when I was a baby, I show up Christmas and Easter, I do this thing. Uh, my, grand, my grandma's a, well, I guess my grandma's not a nun unless well, that would be really bad. But I got him in the family, a great aunt, something like that. All right? What happens when you try to share the gospel with somebody like that? They're furious and they gnash their teeth at you. Okay? Sometimes it's because we, we do so in a proud or offensive way, but, but man, even if we're humble, there is an offense in the gospel. When you come to somebody and you say, you know what? I, I know you think you're a good person, but I don't think you're good enough. It's an offensive message. I remember when I was sharing the gospel with my now wife, Jess, when we were back in college. She gnashed her teeth at me. She gnashed her teeth hard. Brought the gospel to her Friday before she went home for the weekend. I just couldn't wait any longer, share the gospel with her. She kind of got it. She was kind of confused. She got enough to come back that Sunday night and say, can we go for a walk? And I've been praying for her all weekend. I wanted to spend time with her. I wanted to tell her about Jesus. Can we go for a walk? Oh, yeah, we can go for a walk. That'd be great. We get down the stairs around the corner, and she lights me up. Who do you think you are? You don't think I'm a good person? You think you're a better person than me because you listen to music that I don't listen to? No. Until this moment, I thought you were a better person than me. Right now I'm questioning that. Maybe I am a better person than you. But you are angry because I'm just telling you the truth. Because I'm telling you that, that while you have a cultural thing going on that you associate with Jesus and you would say, I'm a Christian... Jesus is not at the center of your life. I know you kind of like Jesus, but you don't love Jesus. You haven't surrendered your life to Jesus. I'm not trying to shame you. I'm just trying to be honest with you. Your story is not about Jesus. Your story is about you. And she was ticked. We did that three nights in a row. Two hours of screaming. Two hours of screaming. The last night it was four hours of screaming. She screams a little bit. She, she kind of has this, we won't get into that. It's not going to help anymore. Love you, babe. Until finally the Holy Spirit broke through and, and she just realized, you know, you're right. This isn't my story. I have not surrendered my life to Jesus. I kind of like Jesus. I want to be associated with Jesus. It's a nice story. Who doesn't want to call themselves a Christian? Okay, a lot of people don't. She did. But when I shared that story with her, she gnashed her teeth at me because it cut at her identity, at who she thought she was. Not because she followed Jesus, but because she liked to think of herself as a follower of Jesus. When these guys heard this, they were furious, and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. 
He says, I see Jesus standing up from his throne to get a better look at what is going on right now. And that made him even more bold. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, Ah! They rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Similar thing to what we see Jesus praying. Then he fell on his knees, and just like Jesus, he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Is that your story? Are you so overwhelmed with the gospel that if people were throwing rocks at you, your first thought wouldn't be, how do I get away from these people? Or, God, would you strike these people down for persecuting me in your name? But your first thought would be, God, would you forgive them? God, I love these people and I know I ticked them off because I was honest with them. But God, I love these people and I don't want you to hold this sin against them. They are killing me. Man, but what I want is that they would come to know you. I don't want vengeance. I want grace for them. Is that how you process the world? Has the gospel grasped your heart in such a way that you would extend that sort of grace? Has the gospel grasped your heart in such a way that that when you think about your neighbor, You don't think with a lot of frustration about the fact that his dog is continuing to poop in your front lawn. But you think, oh, my neighbor needs Jesus and I want to tell him about Jesus. At all costs, I want to tell him about Jesus. Even if he's going to be ticked at me for being honest with him about Jesus, I just want my neighbor to know about Jesus. Is this our story? Are we allowing our hearts to be transformed by the gospel in such a way that we would make it our story. And what would it look like if we did? What would it look like if this church spent the entire week living like Stephen lives? What if we went out there, grasped by the gospel, impacted by the gospel, overwhelmed by the gospel, so much that we would show grace to people and that we would proclaim the name of Jesus, believing that that is the most loving thing that we could do? How do we get there? Because a lot of us would say, I want to follow Jesus. It's not that I'm trying to play games with Jesus. I just don't know how to follow Jesus. I've got I've got a New Year's resolution every week. But it doesn't seem to be changing the way that I follow Jesus. I don't feel like my story is getting any more aligned with his story or my heart any more aligned with his heart. Best thing I can say, I mean... It's great to pray, it's great to get in His Word, it's great to get in community, rub off on other people, but I think at the core of it is that we continue to go back to the Gospel and we continue to reflect on what Jesus has done for us until we see ourselves transformed by His actions towards us that that affect our actions towards others. And that's exactly what we see with Stephen. We talked about it last week that there's this incredible parallelism between Stephen and Jesus, the way that Stephen preached and the way that Jesus preached. The way that Stephen died and the way that Jesus died. That his closing words are essentially the same as Jesus. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. I want grace for them, not judgment. I want my life to be like the life of Jesus. I want to imitate Jesus. How do we do that? We do that by reflecting on Jesus. 